Good afternoon, everyone, at least for those of you joining us on the East Coast from Frederick, Maryland, AOPA's headquarters. Happy to welcome you to the first Don't Get Rusty webinar of the year 2023, and it's a good one. Anyone there? Non-Towered Airport Operations. So thanks for joining us all today. We appreciate it. Quick housekeeping items first uh, for those that are uh, have questions for us, please go ahead and use the GoToWebinar control panel. For those on a computer, if you click that question mark uh, in the little bubble there, it'll pop up that screen. You've got the ability to type in your lesson, but please make sure that you hit send. If you click that send button, then it'll get to us and we'll do our best to cover all the questions as we go through here today. If you're logging in and watching on a tablet, same concept, a little bit different. Looking at that image on the bottom, you can see the question mark. You just press that, the question bubble pops up. Type in your question, press send. End. Don't forget that spot, and then we'll get that on our end, and we will be able uh, to respond either live or uh, we'll type in back to you. But appreciate you all being here. Um, very likely, the first question we're going to get on either computer users or tablet users is, where's Pablo? So as Pablo has shared uh, in previous, he's moved out to Colorado. He is now pursuing other opportunities. Uh, so unfortunately to report, he's not part of our everyday team here uh, with the You Can Fly group uh, and won't be on uh, the, the Don't Get Rusty webinars regularly, but we certainly hope to have him back uh, with us as a special guest. So he's going to be missed sorely. Uh, we appreciate that, and we hope to, to bring him to you here in future webinars as a special guest star. Uh, with that, quick introduction. Hi, I'm Dan Justman. This is my second go-to webinar, uh, Vice President with uh, You Can Fly Programming and the You Can Fly Group with AOPA Foundation. I have the privilege of working with the Flight Training Group, Chris and Steven, as you know, uh, also the Rusty Pilots programs and the Ambassador programs as well. So great to be here with you today and also would like to introduce or reintroduce to those that have been regulars for the program, Chris Mosier. Hey everybody, always glad to be here with you. Uh, I'm Chris Moser and obviously I work here at AOPA and I work with flight schools and flight instructors trying to provide support for them and our upcoming flight training experience survey and awards. So we're excited to be uh, announcing those in the very near future. And of course, let's throw it over to Steven. As we always say, say hello, Steven. Hello, Steven. I forget it's old. I know, incognito. <laughs> Incognito, that's right. Stephen, of course, we will reveal um, his face at 1 million subs when we get there or, or at some other point in the future when we decide it'll be fun. <laughs> I love it. Awesome. Special thanks to sponsors, uh, the Jeppesen Four Flight and Boeing companies uh, doing a great job of supporting and growing uh, current and future pilots, supporting general aviation. Thank you uh, for your generous support. Without these great companies, we would not be able to do what we do. So thank you. Thank you. We appreciate you greatly. Uh, we are all obviously watching live here. Um, if you would like to watch uh, down the road, we will be on uh, YouTube channels, the AOPA pilot video channel. Uh, Chris, if you could go ahead and click that slide over to the next one. There it is, sorry. There yep. you go, thank you. We're on YouTube, AOPA pilot video channel. Just look under playlist, don't get rusty webinars and our entire library will exist there. You can also see us on AOPA.org uh, webinars page. So AOPA.org, uh, you'll find us there under news and media and the webinars page. Next question coming up very likely is gonna be wings credit. Do we get wings credit for this webinar? Absolutely. If you have registered with the email address that you have registered with the FAA for wings credit, you will automatically get wings credit. There's nothing more that you need to do. We've got you logged in to the system. We see that you're here. Thank you for joining us and we will take care of that uh, on our end. It happens automatically. All right. January 19th, 2023, crazy to think we're here already. I don't know about you guys, but I'm still writing like 19 on my checks when I'm filling those out. So I can't believe we're here at, at 2023. But on this day in history, back in 1937, Howard Hughes flew the famed H1 racer across country. Hard to believe at that day and age, he did that in seven and a half hours. An amazing yeah. journey and feat. And of course, the first things that I think of is like, all right, what did he eat? How did he go to the bathroom? How did he make it happen? And how did he do it without GPS? Just absolute amazing, um, absolute amazing uh, aviation 
uh, adventure there. So pretty cool stuff on that front. So with that, time to move on to our poll. So the poll question today related to our topic. The question is, which of the following are not allowed at a non-towered field? So you guys should all see on your screens the quick poll uh, screen there. So it gives you the opportunity to select one. We're going to give it a little time as we go through. But the question again is, which of the following are not allowed at a non-towered field? 45 degree entry to downwind, crossing midfield direct to downwind, a straight in final approach, all of the above are allowed, or not sure, non-towered field seems scary. There's no way I'm even going to try it. It's towered fields for me forever. Um, <laughs> so we will not be voting on that, but we need you guys to do so. So as the numbers go in um, and we've got some participation there, um, we will show the results here. Chris, what do you think? Hey, uh, you know what? This is, uh, of course, I, I wrote this one. So, but what do you think the, what do you think people would say? Cause it's like, I know there are some people, I know for me, at least when I was learning, I learned out of a towered field. So going to non-towered did seem scary at first. So I just definitely wonder what we've got 1%, uh, 1% or well, one person may be saying that right now. So we've got, actually we're like 77%, but what do you think, Dan, which one uh, did you not like, or do you think? Meh? Well, the, the two that, I have flown most commonly, um, and it just depends on what side of the airport you're coming in from, the 45 entry to downwind, I feel like that's the standard. That's the one that I was taught right from the beginning um, and probably most commonly fly, but also coming in from the other side to the active runway is crossing midfield, then a descending turn to join the downwind at a 45. So the same concept there. So those are kind of the same, just depending on which side that you're coming into. So those two make sense. The straight in, I pretty sure you can do it it's possible but i think that gets a little bit confusing you know when does it start who's got priority on the straight in approach um, yeah. you know all those questions come on so um yeah. you know great great questions here great answer for sure so and of course i didn't notice we have a link at the bottom please ignore that link that was from last time um but yeah so it's like the and then we've got over 80 percent. you guys are amazing 85 percent. and the correct awesome. answer is by 78 percent of our audience saying all of the above are allowed, and that actually is the correct answer. We're going to talk about um, each of these today because that was uh, some of the common questions we got from people ahead of time. And then we did have 1% of people saying they seem scary and totally get that. It's probably trained in a towered field. Just the way it's funny because people that train at non-towered fields get scared by the tower. So it's just about what you learn. Okay, let's, um, let's get moving on here. So, Chris... What are we doing today? This is a great topic. I know we've had a lot of questions already coming in, so I'll get cranking on those uh, as we go. But please fill us in. What are we going to be doing and talking about today? So what are we doing? Well, the, the thing was I, I went and did some research on this, and that's why I know we've got the handout in there for you. And I noticed somebody thanked us for the handout. Absolutely. I, I figured it makes it easier if you can go read stuff um, afterwards and, and do your own research. But we're gonna talk about just some general operating practices at the very beginning, and then we're gonna spend some time discussing and hopefully answering questions and approaching to land, the different ways you can do that, um, communication and best practices in doing that, the actual traffic pattern itself, and, and of course there are, we did have one question, uh, we actually had like five different questions that were submitted ahead of time, and it turns out, and in fact some of the ones I'm seeing popping up, we're gonna address a lot of the stuff that you guys are asking uh, throughout this uh, webinar today. And then we had one person and asked one that was kind of a tower question. So I threw that as a bonus at the end, um, assuming we've got time. So keep asking the questions. Dan is gonna be overwhelmed by all the questions because we know you guys are awesome, you ask tons. Um, and we will do our best to answer as many as we can, but please be patient with us because you guys ask a lot. And uh, of course, we're trying to present while we're doing that. So first off, non-towered fields, general operating principles, what should we do? Well just to cover some basics and just so you know what i ended up doing i used the faa advisory circular there's a link on the handout uh, it's uh advisory circular 90-66 bravo 66 bravo um change one is the most up-to-date one and uh, i use that kind of as a guide so a lot of the flow or the things you're going to see are coming out of there and then i sort of peppered in regs and other stuff uh, as appropriate but one of the first things that it begins with is just talking about some general operating principles that we want to use um, for that. And some of this you're going to know, and some of this I try to pick out things that for me, in fact, I learned a couple of things doing the research here too that I was like, I didn't know that or I hadn't clarified that. Um, 
and so some of the stuff you'll know and so hopefully some of the things you'll be like oh that's that's new to me and that's what i tried to pick out so the first part left turns are the default of course we generally know that left turns when you go to a non-towered field we assume left turns unless they are notated by something else um, the faa and the advisory circular mentions what i've got on the screen there which is the segmented circle so you're looking for that and just to clarify i'm going to use the mouse hopefully you guys can see that but when we look at the segmented circle these lines are base and final base and final why am i pointing that out because i'm hoping that most of my certificated pilots out there already know this i'm pointing it out because when i was a student pilot for some reason i think i thought it was like base and final and this one was upwind and crosswind or or whatever i had done and i definitely was confused about this up thinking this was upwind and crosswind i went to an airport on a solo cross-country flight down on the eastern shore of maryland right next to a restricted area and i flew on the wrong side of the pattern in effect and because i was looking at that going oh it's this traffic and there was another pilot in the pattern that said to me you know it's like you know hey six five six five nine or the traffic's on the other side. I'm like, no, it's not. I was adamant that it wasn't because it was like, I'm, it's, that's upwind and crosswind. So, no, it's not. It is base and final. So, in this case, you can see base to final is a left turn. So, for that runway going this direction from right to left on my screen here, that would be left traffic. But of course, if you saw this one, this is base to final for the runway going from left to right. And that would be right traffic in that case. So, just good to be aware of. All right, Chris, I've got a question. I think it's going to lead you a little bit into the next one. It's about determining traffic flow. Um, what is, is there a recommended way or proper way to ask which runway is the active? Stephen uh, put that in the questions, asking, is there a, is a preferred way or proper way to ask for which runway is active versus, you know, picking up the, the weather or, or just guesstimating? Yeah, there's a, a couple of ways. So, I'll, in fact, I'll go through those. Um, tell you what, before I hit that question, let me just okay. jump back. I want to hit collision avoidance really quick because it's short. For collision avoidance, don't forget that in a non-towered field, just like any time we're flying under visual rules, and in fact, even if you're flying IFR and you're in you know, visual conditions, it is our responsibility as PIC to avoid other traffic. And this was interesting in the advisory circular here, the FAA also makes a point of saying, not only are we to be looking for other traffic, but we should be doing what we can to make ourselves visible to that traffic. So our responsibility at a non-towered field in this case, and I would say anytime in visual conditions, is to see and avoid and make it easier for others to see and avoid you. Now, let's jump down to that. How do we determine traffic flow? So that said, one thing you could do is if you are flying over a field and you don't hear any other traffic and you'll do maybe one of the other things I can suggest here in just a moment, you fly over, you look for that segmented circle and you're looking at the wind sock. And of course we would know the wind is blowing in this case from lower left to the upper right of the screen. So I would want to land into the wind. So I'd want to use this, this runway over here. So I would check out the segmented circle and see which, which way is the wind blowing. Maybe I've listened to the ASOS or the AWAS, and I know which way the wind's blowing and picking my runway that way. But here are the ways on the radio to handle that. Number one, if there's another airplane in the pattern, and, you've, you, and it's assuming that the wind is not hellaciously like they're doing some kind of crazy 15-knot tailwind sort of action, um, let, do, use whatever runway the other traffic is using. So that's the first way, is just make your initial call. More than likely, if somebody else is in the pattern, they're gonna call back, and they're gonna let you know, hey, well, this is the runway that we're using, Therefore, you should just enter the pattern, and we'll talk about how to do that a little later, but do that in the same way. If you call and there's no traffic in the pattern, you don't hear anybody, you could, um, you could also uh, just ask for an airport advisory is one thing you could do. So you could request an airport advisory. There's not a requirement that the FBO or somebody at the non-towered field has to answer that, but they might, and they might let you know, especially if it's not busy. If it's busy and stuff's going on, just go with the flow of traffic. Mm -hmm. um, don't clog up the radio with that necessarily, but you can ask for that uh, traffic advisory and they'll tell you, this is the, this the wind's blowing this way. Um, they might even say things like, I've heard them say things like, uh, airplanes have been using, but it's up to you. You're the pilot in command to determine yeah. that. And, and if the wind's calm, you know, you don't have that indicator either. No traffic, no wind. What's what's the best way to deduce, you know, the preferred runway? Um, if with, I say that again, if the, with the wind? If there's no traffic, so you can't hear from them or, yeah. and there's no wind, like the wind sock's just sitting flat down, you can't quite tell, you don't really oh. have a good idea. Is there a way to know preferred or, or are you just no. reaching out and, and, and trying? That is to... completely up to you. And, right. and in that case, you just make the call. 
if you've done your pre-flight preparation well and you've like researched this airport, read about it, in some cases you may find that they might say calm wind runway is this, and they they might have that as a note in the uh, the chart supplement slash the old AFD um, or you know another maybe on their website or whatever. So it's like there may be that information, but what it really comes down to is that generally you'll get to pick that runway if you know that and have done your research and there is a calm wind runway that they prefer that you use, try to to do that as well because it could be for noise abatement or something like that. All right, let's keep moving through this because we got other stuff I know. I already see tons of questions and I will, yeah, Captain's Choice, I see Scott just said there. Um, so the next one down is IFR because these are just meant to be quick little hits because we're going to get into the meat in a second. IFR versus VFR, the big point here is that when we are at a non-towered field, even though IFR gets preference with ATC at a non-towered field, there is no IFR preference over VFR. IFR needs to give way to VFR. They're both equal. So just because you're on an IFR clearance does not give you any kind of precedence over anyone else in that VFR pattern. Um, so you need to fall in with traffic just like you normally would. Um, obviously, if you're coming in doing an approach and it's hard instrument conditions, that's different because you shouldn't be seeing any VFR traffic then. But uh, remember that you are equal to that VFR traffic. Hey, Chris, I've got a quick one, kind of the other way. This could be related to IFR or VFR as well, but it's related to a flight plan. So mm -hmm. how do you activate a flight plan? So it's kind of going the other way, on the way out. How do you activate mm -hmm. a flight plan from a non-towered airport if the phone yeah. isn't listed? Yeah, so uh, the big thing you can do is just call flight service. If I'm assuming that most people, I would make the assumption, have a cell phone. So on your cell phone, call flight service. They will do it for you. They can open that flight plan. And even they can coordinate, if you're doing an IFR flight plan out of it, they can coordinate with ATC. They'll call you. They'll call back. They'll give you an expect further clearance time. Uh, I'm sorry, not an expect further clearance, but uh, I... Um, avoid if not off by time so they'll they'll give you a, a clearance of that and they'll say you know you have 10 minutes to get off the ground so typically i used to do this when i flew freight i would get down to the run-up area i would go i would already filed my flight plan get to that run-up area make sure everything's ready i would probably have done my run-up and then call and have them up that way when they told me boom you're ready to go i could just go right out into the runway you know assuming it's clear and everything and take off um so have all that other stuff taken care of all right don't forget you can be dealing with an aircraft that does not have a radio at a non-towered field. Um, and so in that case, be alert and be watching. And there's some tips for no radio aircraft. If you're one of the one operating a no radio aircraft, be courteous and be predictable. In fact, I know throughout the document, it mentions where airplanes that don't have radios, they should definitely be making the 45 entry, which we'll talk about later, um, and not doing anything unpredictable because again, they're not able to announce what they're doing. So be predictable, be visible. And then finally on this one, just wake turbulence. It was just the idea of, like, don't forget, you get wake turbulence alerts at a towered field. Don't forget that in a non-towered field, airplanes still make a wake. So be cautious about that if you've got somebody coming ahead of you, whether it's a, a jet or a helicopter or just something bigger than you are. Be cautious about wake turbulence. Okay. Now, let's get into the meat here. One of the ones that came up in our, I think it was one or two of the questions ahead of time, and I know that this is one that I have heard as a CFI, gets into these approaches to land. Um, I'm going to talk about the short and low approach first, then I'll get into the straight in landing because this is the one that often causes a lot of controversy. And uh, I will I will share what I've learned and and uh, just some tips with that. Number one, short approach. If you hear somebody saying short approach, we'll hear this at Tower Fields too, but a short approach just means that they are going to be, usually it's like a practice power off 180 approach, like you pull the engine, a beam, your landing spot, and you're going to be tighter than normal. Your base is going to be closer in than normal um, to make this approach. So when you say, I'm going to make a short approach because I'm practicing this, then just expect them to be tighter in making this landing. So it could be just a tight turn closer in than the normal base. They might even round off um, the base to final um, just because they're trying to get it down and practice a no engine or an engine out landing. That said, if you're in a, and then here's a theme that I wanna, Dan, I, I don't know if what you think about this, but there's a theme throughout today's entire webinar that I picked up, not only just from my own experience and my own, my own opinion, but in the FAA documents, and in fact, I was even uh, chatting with Richard McSpadden earlier today on a question that I had, and he even, without me even mentioning it, came up with the same thing. We need to be courteous with one another. We have to work Great together point. on these. So there's going to be things, especially coming in on straight in landings, where there's this question of who has the right of way and all this other stuff. What it really comes down to is we need to be courteous, and we'll talk more about that as the theme. So when you're, if you're going to do a short approach, 
courteous would be if the pattern is really busy, you may not want to be practicing short approaches then because you're going to potentially be squeezing people or, you know, you just be courteous. If the pattern's busy, maybe go somewhere else to practice short approaches where it's not busy. Um, even at tower fields, I usually won't ask for that unless I know it's not busy or I've got plenty of room to, to make way for that. It, it's great Another consideration. Yeah. For sure, because it's it's the common sense factor, right? It's like if it's busy, it's not the right time and place to do that. And you wouldn't want others to be offending you just like so you wouldn't want to offend others in those things. It's like really at the bottom line, we want at the end of the day, we want everyone to fly safe, have an enjoyable flight. And just because you may have the uh, right to do something doesn't necessarily make it a good idea in that time, place and airport. So, yeah, just be good people, right? Yep, absolutely. And we're going to talk about that again when we talk about if there's disagreements that happen and how to handle that. Um, another type of approach you may see, and this is, I don't, this is not, you know, it's just, it's just because I saw it and it's interesting. I like to do these low approaches. So if someone says they're going to make a low approach, it generally shouldn't be messing up the flow too much. You'll often see this with instrument pilots. Maybe they're practicing an instrument approach and they'll just do a low approach instead. I like to use low approaches. Uh, when it comes to teaching people how to land. And that's just flying along the runway, but you're actually not going to touch down. And so in the case of an instrument, they may do it 100 feet, 200 off the deck. Um, but for uh, for my, you know practicing landing type stuff, we'll get down relatively low. So just be aware of that. The one difference will be in spacing. If they say that they're going to do a low approach, that means they're not going to be slowing down like we would when we touch down. You know, getting below, like in a Cessna, for instance, when you touch down, you're probably at 55, 50 knots and potentially slowing even more before maybe you do a touch and go. Um, so with that low approach, they're going to probably be doing at least 70, 65, 70 knots the whole way down the runway. So just keep that in mind for spacing purposes. And keep it in mind if you're the one doing it, you're going to be going faster than you normally would. Chris, back to the short approach quick. We had a mm -hmm. question on, uh, is a short approach also called a tight pattern? bit of an anecdotal thing there but have you heard that in you're flying a tight pattern yeah, short approach that would definitely be one maybe a nickname for it i have not yeah. seen that in any of the like the faa stuff yeah. um but if they somebody said that i'm going to do a tight pattern you might see i i know that there was i did my tailwheel endorsement with a guy in a super decathlon and um he would call things like that so that's just more of sort of slang for it mm -hmm. the big part is if you don't understand what they mean and we'll talk about this again later is clarify just making sure you mean you're doing like a, a short approach or whatever just making sure i understand what what it is you're doing um, so I can plan ahead and, and uh, adjust my pattern accordingly. And then here's, let's hit this one. I know that this one is controversial, controversial, straight in landings. So there's this big thing. I know when I flew freight, I tried to avoid doing this. Can you make a straight in landing? Well, it's a non-towered field. And the FAA, and I looked at, and I put a couple of uh, FAA letters of interpretation in here. There are the regs, 91.113 talks about uh, the right of way when it comes to straight in landing, AC 90-66B, which is on non-towered airport ops in section 8.2.1 and 9.5, all mention this stuff about straight in landings. Can you do it? Yes, you can. But even though in 91.113, the, the, and the reg says that an aircraft on final has the right of way over other aircraft in the pattern, and it says there's also the part in there about if like if there's two aircraft approaching final, the one that's lower has right away, and you're not supposed to take advantage of that to cut somebody off. Um, and apparently the FAA is very strict about that. So if somebody does cut somebody off, there's there have been enforcement actions against people like that. And there's a post I I think a link in there for from our pilot information center that discusses that. So you can get into more details there if you want to look at it later. But in the AC, it's pretty clear. Yeah, you can make a straight-in approach, but it says it's under that uh, 9.5 section. If you're making a long straight-in approach, number one, you shouldn't be doing it at a busy pattern. Number one, do not do it at a busy pattern. Number two, it's like if it's busy, you should not be interrupting the flow of traffic. So it's like if it's busy, you really should be maneuvering to make a 45 entry, which is the preferred entry, which they say again and again and again, mm -hmm. the the letters of interpretation from the FAA's legal office, 45 entry is the preferred way to do it because we can be predictable. The other thing they say too, though, is uh, for that straight in, is it do not, it doesn't give you necessarily like on these long ones, it's like you just, you want to be courteous. Don't do it if it's busy. and also, you shouldn't be disrupting the flow of traffic. Those are the two things they give. So right there, that just leads back into that whole idea of being courteous. You know, you can make a straight-in approach, but do it when it's not busy. If it is busy, be courteous. Do the 45 entry instead. So, Chris, what's a 
are there any rules of thumb or distances for like a straight in approach right of way? Um, Scott had mentioned, please don't take, and that was in quotes, you know, the right of way on a 10 mile final, a straight in right. final. So I was like, is there any rules of thumb or guidance that we could offer there? Or maybe the FAA shared. So this is where that go check out that post from the AOPA pilot information center that I have on the handout. It gets into some of that. Unfortunately, the and in reading some of the letters of interpretation the faa purposely has not tried to um what i want to say to legislate or to regulate every possible situation because they want to give us flexibility so in effect they're depending on us to be courteous with one another um and i'm talking about and if somebody said is that on an ils or whatever actually they say this for instrument approaches too so it's like if we're flying in there's vfr traffic even on an instrument approach you need to be breaking off and potentially, if this pattern is busy with VFR traffic, you need to be breaking off and joining the pattern. Um, if you're on an instrument, like even on an instrument clearance, you need to join the VFR pattern. You're not supposed to be coming in or work it out with the other pilots if it's not busy. So it's all about being courteous, working it out. There is not legislation on this. In that post, one person mentioned that, you know, um, from the, the case that they looked at, I believe, and I'm not, I couldn't tell exactly if it was just their opinion on this, but obviously if someone's on a 10 mile final, work it out with them because you do not need to extend your downwind out 10 miles because somebody's on a final. Obviously, if you can make it in without disrupting their approach, then it would be appropriate, communicate with them, it'd be appropriate to make your turn, go ahead and land in front of them. Now, if they're on like a, and you have to use your judgment here, what kind of airplane is it? How fast are they coming, right? You could even ask them. You okay if I go ahead and make my turn to final here, you're 10 miles out, you're eight miles out. Sure. If they're coming in really fast to jet, you might want to say, I want to give them more leeway because they, you know what I mean? So what they're, unfortunately there's an not- an ILS approach. You know, that that's not just yeah. VFR either. It's, it's, it, it all counts, right? Yeah, it all counts. Even if you're on an IFR clearance coming in, and in fact, that's in the advisory circular as well. And by the way, this just reminds me, some people say, like, I've heard this in the past, you know, the, there's the regs and then these advisory circulars and the AIM, are they're not regulatory. But I've read multiple times in the FAA's letter of, of interpretation that even though they are not necessarily regulatory, the FAA provides this stuff as a way for us to comply with the regulations. So this is what they're looking for us to do. So it's like they will use this in enforcement actions. Why did you not follow what was in the AIM? Why did you not follow what was in the AC? We were giving you the directions on how we would like you to comply with these regulations. So so don't just discount this stuff because it's not a reg. Um, you know, it's, it's just keep that in mind. So yeah, on an instrument clearance, uh, even if you're coming in on an instrument approach, then, and I know somebody else mentioned comms, I'll talk about that in a little bit, but even on an instrument approach, you are supposed to like, if it says right here, in fact, I'm looking at it, 9.6, pilots conducting instrument approaches in VMC, visual meteorological conditions, should be alert for other aircraft in the pattern as to avoid interrupting the flow of traffic and should bear in mind that they do not have priority over VFR traffic. So right there, if you're coming in on an ILS and you're in VMC, right, and there's other people in the pattern, you might need to break off, maybe enter an upwind, come back around. You, you've you got to figure out how you're going to enter that pattern. You can't just blast in and take over because I'm on an ILS. That's that's That does not give you the right of way uh, necessarily. So just keep that in mind. Um, so let's be courteous. Let's work it out with each other. Okay. Hope that covers it. I know that this is a controversial subject, but that's what I was finding. And there is no, unfortunately, no concrete answer. Um, I will talk about how to handle some of that stuff. We had a person submit a question that was very passionate, and I am remiss about remembering the person's name that submitted this question, but I wanted to talk about it. It is covered in 90-66B, or Bravo. Uh, it's the overhead approach. And the big part that they see is that sometimes people don't know what the overhead approach is, or they haven't heard of that before. So this is typically something that's done by aerobatic aircraft, high performance formation flights will use this, warbirds. Normally you're gonna see it at towered fields, but it can be done at non-towered fields as well. And in fact, this is the question I spoke um, with our head of the Air Safety Institute, Richard McSpadden about. Um, and so I put all the references there. It's in the AIM, it's in the AC. Uh, there's an AOPA article about, it goes into detail what it looks like. But the basic idea is, I'm gonna use my mouse here if you can see it, that there'll be an initial point they will come in, they will typically be 500 feet above the pattern. I will talk about pattern altitudes because I saw questions about that too. Um, and so, and I see the Watsonville question, uh, so I'm gonna address that one as well. It's all coming, everybody. Um, and so <laughs> 500 feet above the pattern, they'll come in, sometimes in formation, they will hit their break point, typically over their landing spot or the numbers. They will then break and enter the downwind 
and then do a 180 degree turn descending into the pattern. I know that when I saw this, I'm like, do they really do this at a non-towered field? And this is why I wanted to talk to Richard McSpadden about it. And he said, yeah, it's like a carrier break. Some people will call it too. So this is okay. But I talked to Richard again, what was his theme? We need to be courteous. If the pattern's busy, don't do this, right? This is not a good idea. You need to communicate. If the pattern's not busy, the big point for us as, as non-formation pilots or non-aerobatic pilots is to know what it is they're talking about. So if, if an aerobatic plane's coming in, the pattern's not that busy, and they say they'd like to do this, then we should be aware, okay, I know what they're gonna do. They're gonna fly overhead, they're gonna descend down, so I wanna work with them if possible. If it's really busy, then maybe we ask them, hey, maybe don't do that because the pattern's really busy here. Um, and so, yes. And I see that the part about the upwind entry to the pattern, and we'll talk about that as well, especially on things like go arounds, it'll kind of fit in with that. Um, so that's the basic idea of what's happening. Check out the video, check out the article. There's a video in that article. Check it out so you understand what it is. Formation, aircraft in formation will do this, and they'll literally come in and they will break their formation apart at a sort of like a delayed fashion, like so many seconds after one another and enter the pattern that way. Again, that is hopefully not something, if you're a formation pilot out there, you're not doing this at a busy pattern, I hope, um, or you're, if you're at a towered pattern, you're getting permission to do this. So hopefully that covers it. Um, I thought that was really an interesting thing and I learned a whole bunch from reading about this myself. All right, any questions, Dan, before I move on to the next one? Well, there's lots of questions. I'm just kind of grouping them up here because a lot of it is the stuff that's coming down here. Um, but there have been a couple notes about just the curiosity and the concern about the overhead approach and, and it, you know, being dangerous, being uh, because it's yeah. different than what the other pilots are doing. So I think it's it's great that people are recognizing that and making that observation. Um, but I think Chris, you nailed it on the head by saying, you know, awareness is the key. Um, so everyone knowing what that is when they hear it, be prepared uh, to expect, and um, we'll we'll get everybody down on the ground safely. So I think that's that's great. And we know Richard. By the we know Richard well. He's the he's the you know is uh is it the VP or I forget his exact title, but the head of our Senior Air Safety VP, Institute. Yep. Senior VP of the Air Safety Institute, and he is a, a very experienced the head of the Thunderbirds, former head of the Thunderbirds, experienced formation pilot. He said, yeah, they do this, but he said again, be courteous. I saw the one question about altitude. What will happen is at the initial point is where they'll start their descent. So when they hit and they break off, that's when they start this descending turn and then down to this 180. So some people call it a carrier approach. Check more out about it on the article. It goes into more detail about what happens and how they actually perform it. But yes, potentially dangerous. That's why I was like, seriously, at a non-towered field? But that's when I mentioned that Richard, he said it's when it's not busy, they gotta be courteous. If it's busy, they you know they hopefully they're not doing this. Hopefully they're using good judgment themselves and not doing this, because that would be incredibly dangerous for them to be doing descending into the downwind. That would be nuts. Um so again, it's hopefully someplace where they're like not many, maybe there's one person they can work it out with them to say that they're gonna do. Okay. Chris, so, we had a we had a good comment on uh straight in approaches. And you know, it's assuming that the traffic pattern, unless otherwise noted, is at a thousand feet AGL. And someone coming in on a straight in final 10, eight, five miles, they're most likely going to be higher than a thousand. So then, you know, naturally that would give right away to the low the aircraft lower in the pattern. So I think by rule of thumb and by general that that makes sense and that's how things would play out. And also, again, a reminder, don't try to sneak that in by coming in lower and coming right. in lower earlier one and that's not necessarily a safe practice for you, you want to have as much altitude as possible make sure that you can reach the field in case of having an engine out but um but even so don't don't try to be sneaky and get and get in you know just just fly the way that it should be flown and be courteous to others in the pattern and that is like by far the biggest thing work together let's not be let's not be mean out there let's not be trying to force things on other people um so it's work together so we can all be safe because nobody wins, and we'll talk yep. about that in a little bit. Nobody wins when we try to force right away on each other. That is just a bad idea. Yep. All right. One we more one more quick one, Chris, that just came in. Just you know, And it's just comparison of the different aircraft. You've got Jet and an IFR clearance. They're coming mm -hmm. in. They're, they're cleared uh, to land. They're coming in where there's other traffic in the pattern. I think that's where, you know, the pilots each need to use – common sense and the courtesy as well is that you know it, it may not it may be best for you if you're in the pattern to extend your downwind to allow that jet to come in but also if you think you can make it just put that ask out there right um right and, and say you know i'd like to come in i'm i'm on final ready to turn base um and 
Go ahead. And the big thing that I would say is my experience has been at non-towered fields, working with students or when I was flying freight. Um, my experience has been, especially with guys flying jets and things like that, they just, the good, the, the courteous ones just ask. They say, hey, I'm in this jet. Would you mind? I'm on this, this I'm on the three mile final. Would you, would you be okay if I went ahead and landed? You know, and guess what my answer typically is? Go ahead. I will extend my downwind, no big deal, because I get it. They're flying a jet. They're expensive to fly, even more expensive than the, the planes that we're flying. And and I know that it's probably hard for them to maneuver in the pattern. So it's like, yeah, just ask. Just work yeah. it out. And at, at the same time, I've had jets that are on a 10-mile final. I say, hey, would it be okay if I'm about – I'm ready to turn base here. Is it okay if I go in ahead of you? And just you just communicate with each other. So yep. that's the biggest thing is work it out. Quick, quick correction, too. I had said cleared to land at a non-towered airport, Scott – had mentioned that. You're right. Sorry, that was a slip of the tongue on my part. Uh, you're not cleared to land at an untowered airport. That was right. that was a great note. But uh, I meant to say just coming in on an IFR clearance. Right. Okay. Let's talk about comms um, general, and then we're going to talk about how to do some of the, we're going to do a little bit of the call sign stuff, which I know a lot of people were asking about. There is very clear guidance in the advisory circuit, so we're going to get to that on this one. And on the next one, too, I've got some other ones. Man, I found some good stuff in here. This is stuff that I was like, holy cow, I was so excited to, you know, like to find some, some really good guidance on these. Number one, I kind of knew this one already, but all traffic within 10 miles, and I'm assuming it never specifies, I'm assuming nautical miles, which makes sense because that's what we use. But all traffic within 10 miles of the airport obviously using good common sense should be communicating with it uh, be monitoring and communicating on ctaf so if you're approaching a non-towered field you should be making that call and the faa literally says that you should be on frequency of that 10 miles and making your call before eight so somewhere in that as you're sort of breaking into that area making that initial call obviously as appropriate um and then departing was the interesting here one here is when you're departing a non-towered pattern as well stay on ctaf Again, using common sense until you're 10 miles away. Now, why do I say using common sense? Well, what if you're taking off from a non-towered field? And for example, down at Martin State, there is a, um, a non-towered field that's right like within the delta and you've got to get on frequency. Well, obviously then that's different. You got to get on and talk to tower. Uh, so that's a different situation. So use your good common sense based on the situation you're in. But if it's barring any kind of weird circumstances, stay on CTAF um, while you're within 10 miles of that airport, whether coming or going, whether arriving or departing. Now, here's one that we couldn't answer. We had this from last year, and it was where do we find the airport call signs? Like, how do I know? Because sometimes you go to an airport and you're going to use, like, you look in the, the chart supplement and you're wondering, like, well, which, what do I use? Is it Westminster traffic or what, what, what are they using for their call sign? In 90-66 Bravo, they say exactly what to do. We are to use the name of the airport. So in this case, I picked out Westminster. Carroll County Regional Jack B. Pogue Field. Now, you don't have to use this whole thing because even in the example they give, they take usually the first little bits of it. So we use here in Maryland, Carroll County Airport. So it's Carroll County traffic, blah, 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 Carroll County, right? So that's what you're supposed to use. If you find an airport that is using something else other than that, because it specifically says, do not use the city, do not use some other call sign, you're supposed to be using the, the some version of the name of that airport so that obviously pilots that are coming in that don't know that local information will know, will use the correct call sign. So that's what we're supposed to do. So if you're at an airport, maybe have a conversation with the local pilots there, let's all try to be uniform because that helps, it's courteous to other pilots coming in that won't necessarily know that you guys happen to use that we like to do Pogue Field instead, or we've got some other uh, name for the airport that we like to use. Change it up and try, let's try to be uniform because that makes it safer for all of us. So that way we all know what traffic we're talking about. Quick, qu uh, Chris, quick one here. What do you think about uh, giving last call when you're leaving an airport? Is that in the regs or is that common practice or what, what's your suggestion there? I can't say that I specifically went looking for that. I don't ever recall seeing that in the AIM. Um, and, and please feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, if you know that I'm incorrect about that. We know our audience is awesome, so just tell us about that. But uh, no, I've never heard that one. So that is that you know leaving the area it's it depends if the traffic's really busy and you're 10 miles and and especially if you've been monitoring you're, you're leaving that 10 mile area i don't think it's necess necessary if the traffic's not busy and you feel like you want to do it it's not, i don't i don't know there's a i don't know that it's a big no-no by any means but that's that's purely yeah. opinion but How obviously about, if you're leaving that area 10 miles out and it's busy i wouldn't bother with that yeah just use common sense in that situation right yeah 
Okay, yeah. what about for picking up VFR flight following? Um, stay on frequency for 10 miles or try to get to it early to get on flight following? What's the recommendation there? Again, use your good common sense. So, um, you know, if you're concerned about getting that, maybe you're like here, we're close to the, the SFRA, the DC CIFRA, we'll call it. Um, yeah, somebody just said that they see it as recognized as extraneous and necessary. I've never seen it as an official thing, Rick. I, I kind of agree, but like I said, it's use your good common sense. Um, so for the getting the VFR flight following, uh, you know, I'd use again, use your common sense. Like if maybe I'm climbing, right? I'm I'm climbing up or I need to get hold of Potomac approach coming out of Westminster, let's say, uh, because maybe I'm heading south and I want to do that. As long as I know that I'm well clear, I'm way above the pattern to what it normally would be and all that sort of stuff, I might make that decision and I might let everybody know. I'm five miles south, switching to, to Potomac, you know, I was just letting them know and I'm heading south and I'm climbing. Uh, maybe I'm at you know, 2,500 and climbing or whatever. So it's, you, you got to, it depends on the situation. If you've got plenty of room and you can wait that 10 miles and maybe wait to call them. Um, so there, again, there's no hard and fast rules on this stuff. Just try to use what makes sense. If you know it's really busy, there are people practicing near that airport, you might want to stay on frequency just to help yourself avoid traffic. I see there it is, to avoid other traffic. I agree, Scott. So it's like, it's that's where it's that common sense. If there's other people operating, you might want to stay on frequency and, and talk to each other. Um, if it's not, and you know you're well clear, then maybe not. You can use your ADSB uh, to help with that too, make these decisions. But the FAA's general guidance is stay on frequency within 10 miles. Now, again, Use common sense. If I'm 6,000 feet above the airport, do I need to be on frequency with them? Probably not, it, that doesn't make sense. So just use good sense on this stuff. All right, another one, I saw it already popping up earlier today. People were asking right away, do we use red biplane, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The FAA is very clear about this. The minimum that we are supposed to be using is our call sign and the type of aircraft. Actually, it's type and call sign. So it'd be like Cessna 65659er. They say at a minimum. They do also advise if you think that saying something like red and white biplane would be helpful for people to identify you, you can add that on, but you are not to use that in place of your call sign. And the reason is because that call sign is the one thing that is unique to you, right? What if by some chance there's some like a yellow cub, there could be other yellow cubs around, there's lots of yellow cubs or white Cessnas. So you are always to use your type and end number. And if you think it's appropriate, like say, for example, you're flying an experimental aircraft and people have no idea what it is, that's the example they give, um, then you might say white biplane. So it might be like experimental November 65659er uh, and tell them what you're going to do, you know, uh, left downwind runway 22 and red and white biplane. So that way you can put it on there with the, the traffic. So you can use that if you think it'll help people identify you, but do not use it instead of your type and end number. Okay, Dan, this is one I never seen before, this multicom thing. Um, I did not know this one because it's like, I've, I guess all the non-towered fields I've gone to have always had a CTAF or at least a right. Unicom. And I did not know if there, and I guess I should say, I probably have seen airports listed that don't have a frequency, that just not usually ones I was flying to, because usually they're really small. But um, yeah, the, the good question. They didn't address that one, Steve. They asked a full end number. Should we abbreviate that to the last few? Is that okay? Um, that's that's probably your call. The FAA just says, use your end number. It doesn't specify that. So it's like, especially if you hear somebody else on frequency with a similar one to yours, use the whole thing for sure. I don't know. I always say the full thing. I, I guess I get used to my number. I have used it memorized. So my recommendation is use the full thing, but it's like, I'm not going to tell you that there's some guidance that says no, because I've never seen guidance that says not to, unless of course there was definitely someone on frequency that has a similar one. But anyway, the multicom. If you go to an airport that does not have a listed frequency, Multicom, 122.9. If you so, if you don't see a CTAF, there's no Unicom frequency listed. We are to use 122.9er, uh, pretty good. And then just make your calls like normal. So that's kind of a good one to net to to say. Um, anyway, I'm, I'll, I'll hit. I see some of these popping up. Necessary to say November in front of it. What do I normally say? What do I say? Cessna six. I no, I don't think so. It doesn't necessarily. It just says your call sign, your number. So. You could probably leave out to November. I always say 656. Six. I'll, I'll just use the number 1163 one, Mike Echo or whatever. So I don't think you have to say November. So the, there is an opportunity for confusion there too, though, when using the manufacturer, because, you know, Cessna makes or has made, you know, 150s, but also jets uh, as well. So there could be opening the door for confusion there, but that's where the number but really your is. end critical. number is always going to be different. Right. That's right. the key. The end yeah. number is always yep. going to be different. Yep. Now, of course, the only thing that could be, 
uh, thing is that is what if you have somebody from Canada or something that has the same last five uh, you know uh, numbers or digits or whatever letters so that could be possible maybe because they use a different uh, beginning number so yep I've been seeing that some things coming in and that's my recollection as well as on the initial call do the full uh, do your full numbers and then yep. your call sign and then you can do abbreviated for the others but I've also been in patterns where planes have had the last three numbers um, and it was very confusing uh, and really kind of got scary because you're hearing someone's on on final and then someone's on the upwind and it was the same three digits of the tail number. So I don't know how often that could possibly happen, but it's happening and scared the heck out oh, of yeah. me. And so. or just be similar, like somebody have a Mike Echo, yeah. for instance, on the Cessnas yeah. or Sierra Papas. So yeah. that case, use the whole thing. All right, let's keep moving here. We got some other stuff we want to talk about. So communications and best practices. This is hopefully some review here and then a couple of things. Uh, and I really wanted to talk about this handling disagreements thing. So first of all, the name sandwich, I call it, which is basically using that idea of the traffic pattern. So if I'll use Carroll County, for instance. So if I'm making a call, don't forget, I, I'm hoping you guys all know this because you've flown at non-towered fields. It's always, for example, Carroll County traffic, set the 65659er, five miles out, inbound for inbound landing, runway 16, Carroll County. So use the name of the airport at the beginning, use it at the end. Why do we do that? Don't forget, it's because a lot of times those CTAFs are used at other airports. And so you're doing that on purpose because I don't know about you, but I'll hear other people calling. I'm on downwind and I might catch that and I won't have caught the airport they said at the beginning, but then I'm listening at the end because then I hear them say something like Bay Bridge. Okay, I'm not, that's, some, that's somewhere else. It's not where I am. So that's why it's really important to say it at the beginning and end because it's to help us be clear about what's happening. That was really common in Central Florida where I did my flight training, my private instrument training, Chris, is, is there were, you know, shared frequencies really close and you could hear uh, multiple airports and traffic patterns being used for that. So that's that's a great point. So that that was the only way to discern who was where is sandwiching the airport name in. Cool. And by the way, Shane, thanks for that. I didn't know that. The Canada stuff, they all use all letters. So no worries there. You're not going to see that here in, in the, uh, the U.S. apparently. So good tip. Um, all right. When on frequency, we've already heard some people mentioning this theme. Safety essential comms only. Don't try to put extraneous stuff in there. So just keep um, uh, that going. Just keep that in mind. So safety essential comms only. Don't have conversations. Here's one that I know somebody mentioned the Watsonville accident that happened where there was a, it was a Cessna 150 and a 310, I believe. And both were communicating kind of the person that wrote and uh, told me about it said they were kind of being passive about it. They weren't clarifying. Um, you know, what each, they, like there was clearly a conflict that was happening, but neither was addressing it apparently. They just kept making the calls of where they were and apparently they were aware of each other, but neither was making anything. The FAA is very clear. If you make a standard call and another aircraft makes a standard call and you're going, what the heck's going on? It is completely appropriate, safety essential to clarify the intentions. Ask them, what are you doing? You know, try to clarify, are you making final right now? Should I be extending downwind? Whatever, um, keep that in mind. So clarify your intentions. I'm gonna jump down to the last bullet and then I'll hit the other ones in a second here. But that leads into what if in clarifying these intentions, you're getting really frustrated with somebody because they seemingly are cutting you off, taking right of way when you think they shouldn't have it. The time to argue about that is not in the air. The FAA clearly says, sure. do not correct people. Other than clarifying, do not correct people in the air, especially if it's a student pilot. Don't try to correct them in the air, right? Instead, give them the right of way. Make way, let them land, get on the ground, then go discuss your disagreement. Because doing it in the air is, what's it gonna lead to? It's gonna lead to jamming up the, the, uh, the comms. It's gonna lead to distraction, it's gonna to lead to a potential accident. Nobody wins in those situations, nobody. So better deal with it once you get on the ground and then go have a conversation with them. Keep it calm, let's not get, you know, obviously don't be ridiculous, but go and talk to them and try to work it out. Um, but you know, so really, really, it's okay to clarify. You should clarify if, you, if there's a thing happening, just give way. Let the person, if they're being a jerk, let them be a jerk and deal with them on the ground. You know, address it elsewhere. Maybe write their end number down. You can, you can address that later, but don't do that in the air. Okay, a couple quick tips. There is only one thing that I've seen in the, in the AIM that says do not say, which is the any traffic in the area, please advise. That is one you are not supposed to use. I know somebody mentioned that last call thing. Like I said, I haven't seen that one in the AIM necessarily called out, but this one is called out. So do not do that. When you're coming in, you're entering or, or approaching a non-towered airport, just make your position call. 
if appropriate, if you don't hear anything, you can ask for an airport advisor, request airport advisory. But otherwise, any traffic in the area, when you make your call, 65659 or 10 miles north, um, you know, inbound landing, and and then they will, everybody else will chime in if they're there, and then obviously be mm -hmm. watching, determine which way to go. And then the other thing, which was, I had not actually seen this one before, but it makes total sense, avoid using two and four. And I know that I'm guilty of saying two or actually the four, not the two, but the four. So avoid doing that because that can be confused for numbers. I just hadn't thought about that one. So I often will say inbound four landing. Instead, they recommend six, five, six, like Carroll County traffic, Cessna 65659 or um, you know, uh, five miles north, inbound landing runway two, two or one, six or whatever. Just leave out those words two and four, only use them as appropriate for a number. Okay, and then finally, uh, and I already mentioned the handling disagreements. Okay, let's talk about these two. This is another one. I know we've got about 10 minutes left at our normal time, so I'm trying to hit these. Don't worry, we're sticking around for it till at least, or till, <laughs> uh, till 1.30 to make sure we answer these other questions. I know we've got a lot of them in there. And there's good questions. I see yes. them popping up here. Um, all right, number one, which direction? Well, we already kind of handled which pattern you should be using. We talked about that earlier. Use the segmented circle. Listen to the AWOS. Also importantly, listen to the other traffic. Use the same, the, uh, same pattern that other traffic are using as well barring some issue with maybe somebody's not using good judgment and taking off with a hellacious tailwind, then maybe then you might say, well, I'll wait till you're clear and then I'm gonna land the way that I would like to land. But uh, barring something like that, a safety issue, just use the other pattern that people are using. Making the entry, there are, we talked about the straight in, right? That's a possibility, but again, the FAA is very clear. It is not to disrupt other traffic and it is not the preferred entry. The preferred entry is the 45 to the downwind, and I heard somebody asking about this one. If you're on, in this case, this this runway is running um, from what, uh, southwest to northeast, what I would do is if I'm over on the, the, uh, the sort of the eastern side of the airport, I would just set up, potentially make a 45, knowing if, if I know what the traffic looks like and what's going on and I have a clear picture, I could make a 45 entry right into the downwind and like letting everybody know what's, what I'm doing and, and watching for traffic. I would do that at pattern altitude. But let's say I'm coming from the other side of the airport. I wanna fly at at least 500 feet above pattern altitude and above the highest pattern altitude. So if there's jets in the pattern, we normally fly at 1000 AGL, helicopters typically 500 and jets will fly at 1500 AGL. So if there was a jet in that pattern, you'd wanna be aware of that and maybe fly at 2000 AGL, but typically it's gonna be 1500 AGL. So I fly across midfield, I go out, typically about two miles away, little tip here, I usually wait until I turn around and identify the airport again, then I descend well before pattern down the pattern altitude. I used to descend as I was turning, and the problem is if you do that and get down to pattern altitude, a lot of times you can lose the runway and not see it anymore. Now you're flying mm -hmm. blind into the pattern. So I would recommend stay at that 1500 AGL, turn, make sure you can see the runway and then start your descent as long as you know you're not gonna be descending into the actual pattern. Get down the pattern, enter on the 45 and then proceed. There is another approved entry and somebody asked about this in a pre-question. I saw somebody else asking about it in here. There is another one you're gonna see, it's both in this advisory circular, it's in the pilot's handbook of aeronautical knowledge. I have not yet seen them change the aim with this yet, but uh, the deal here is if, and again, it's like the straight in, the FAA says, if the pattern is not busy, if you are not going to disrupt the flow of traffic, you can do a direct midfield entry into the downwind. So if you know that there's nobody there, or you've, you've maybe coordinated, there's not much traffic and you've coordinated with them, you can fly at pattern altitude across the midfield and just do a direct turn right into the pattern. This is where some of those letters of interpretation come in as well, because people are asking, well, in this case, for this this entry here, you're making a right turn onto downwind. Isn't am I not breaking the reg that says only left traffic or whatever? No, the FAA has, has put out letters of interpretation that is not breaking that rule by making these entries. Again, let's use common sense, everybody. All right, go ahead, Dan. Hey, Chris, when when announcing your intentions for these um, approaches, in is teardrop common phraseology? Is that in the circular? Is that in the advisory to be used? Um, and and what's what's the proper? Is it, you know, 45 to downwind overhead? Like, what's the right phraseology to so everyone knows what your intentions are and what your plan is? Um, so, yeah, so I've not heard teardrop. It's, again, it's what's, what's clear. Normally, I will say something like, um, you know, I'm three miles, in this case, let's say I'm, I'm three miles southeast of the field, 
uh, maneuvering for 45 degree entry to runway or you know, to downwind or whatever. It's kind of long, but you try to just try to be as succinct as possible. So it's all about just do people understand what you're talking about? I like the maneuvering for 45 because I'm being clear. I'm I'm setting up, or I might even say setting up for the 45 mm -hmm. entry, you know, and I'll tell people how far out I am. Do you mention that you're going to fly overhead or over the airport? Yes. Like anything? Okay. Absolutely, I do that. So if I'm I'm on if I'm in this section here where I'm crossing midfield, I will say, overflying from west to east or northwest to southeast at, and I'll tell them my altitude. Yeah. You know, so I will say that. So I I will let people know that way they could see like here they expect me, they know where I am, they see this airplane, they're not freaking out, and they can also know where to be looking for me too, because it's all about seeing a void, right? Making just making it easy. Okay. Cool. I saw somebody had a question about an ultralight pattern. Um, I don't necessarily have time. Maybe right now I can mention that maybe in the, the post, but it is, there is a whole section on ultralights in the advisory circular. It talks about that. They will typically fly, fly at 500 feet. They normally are not landing on a runway. They normally have a separate runway, but it does talk about those uh, in there. And so, yes, they will typically fly a tighter pattern. They are flying slower than us and usually lower than us. Um, so just keep that in mind. Okay. Let's hold on to some of those questions. All right, let's talk about the pattern. I think I have two more things I wanted to mention. I'm gonna to try to squeeze them in before our official end and we will stick around for more questions. The uh, the big notes here, the traffic pattern, this is out of the AIM. It's also out of the advisory circular. It just shows obviously all the different legs of the pattern. So let me just hit these relatively quickly. For your base leg turn, you are supposed to maintain altitude uh, until you're at least a beam your numbers, wherever you're going to land, whether it's the numbers or the spot that I'm going to land, you should not be descending below pattern until that point. Then your base leg should be turned at 45 from where you're going to land. Again, whether that's the numbers or maybe you've picked another aiming spot. So 45 degree angle, that's where you should be turning your base leg. Um, for the takeoff and go around, um, for those legs going out, takeoff, you should be climbing. And that's kind of leads into the crosswind turn. So if you're turning crosswind, you should be past the departure end and within 300 feet of pattern altitude before turning crosswind. So just keep mm -hmm. that in mind. All right, so keep those in mind. If you're doing a go around, especially if there's traffic on the runway or something, that's where you potentially sidestep. You know, if you have parallel runways, there's a different situation here. You typically don't see parallel runways at a non-towered field, but usually sidestep away from the pattern. So you can keep an eye on the traffic here and just climb straight out. And again, you want to be at least past the departure end of the runway and within 300 feet of pattern on a go around, you probably would be, but make sure you're clear of the runway before turning crosswind and communicate. And this is where somebody mentioned too, if you're doing a straight in for whatever, again, communicate with other people. Maybe you're not going to do your landing. Maybe you're going to do that and sidestep and come around. Or if there's nobody in the runway, you're going to fly potentially over it. I like to be able to see the runway um, and then, enter the pattern. But again, if you're doing that, maybe it's better just to go out and maneuver for that 45 entry so we're predictable like everybody else. So if that pattern's busy, be predictable. Chris, if you're doing a straight out departure, is there any rule of thumb or recommendation for how far you should maintain that? Let's say you wanted to end up heading to the south if this was how it was oriented there, like you're headed east on a straight out departure, one mile, three mile, five mile, any rules of thumb there, recommendations? The Big thing there is altitude. That's a great question. Departing the pattern, here's a little graphic right here. It shows it here as well. Yep. So there's only two approved or two recommended ways, I should say, for exiting the pattern. Yeah, no downwind exits, to, uh, Mark. I, it's exactly right. They say that you should be doing two ways of departing the pattern. One is straight out on upwind. The other is a 45 degree turn in the direction of the patterns, what they recommend. You are to climb until 500 feet above the highest pattern, then you turn on course. And I know some people are like, but I, the downwind is more effective. Like, seriously, how long does it take you to climb 500 feet above the pattern? Is that an extra, what, 30 seconds, a minute maybe? So get clear of the pattern, then turn on course and continue. So yeah, you're not supposed to be doing downwind exits or anything else. The only thing they recommend is this, and think about it. They're telling you, get away from the pattern, get above the pattern, then turn on course. That yep. makes sense to me of just get, staying clear of other traffic. Yep. And again, that's Good. courteous. I don't want to be disrupting the flow of traffic. Um, airspeed limit, this is not usually an issue for most of it. It's 200 knots. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that one a lot. And then finally, the right of way. I've talked a lot about right of way. The time to argue about right of way is not in the air. Talk about it on the ground. But of course, if you want a quick review, balloons or actually aircraft in distress have right of way over everybody. After that, it's balloons have right of way. Think about least maneuverable, then airships. Um, after that, it's gliders have right away, and then it's helicopters and airplanes. So they all fall on that. So it's obviously being maneuverable and powered, 
gives you the least right of way being not maneuverable <laughs> you know and not being able to move or having no engine is going to give you right away over other types of aircraft okay um last one and then we can hit all these questions and we'll do the official end <laughs> we're, we're doing okay how to handle this is one that is not to do with it but somebody submitted this question so i thought you know what it was only one question i'll hit it really quick maybe if you're interested let us know in the comments or the questions whatever if you want us to do one of these on towered field ops we can put that together for a future episode so let us know if that's something that interests you um so that said how to handle approaching a towered airport when you have multiple towers in the area this is called comments this is you got to use common sense here this is normally not an issue but i used to fly I used to do uh, flight instructing out in arizona this is right near phoenix and look at this there's a delta another delta and another delta and the bravo overlying all of it so if you're approaching an area like this um you know and i don't know if like maybe you're even like dealing with this little non-towered field here if you're going to a non-towered field as long as you're not in anybody's airspace you can do um uh you just you can just get on ctaf and talk to them a lot of times in this case, I might have been talking to Phoenix Approach and then they would hand me off and then let me go onto this non-towered field. If the only time you are required to talk to these towers are if you're entering their airspace. So if you're entering their airspace, obviously you need to talk to them. And if you need to go through, like, let's say you have to go through Chandler's airspace into um, a Mesa's airspace here, or Gateway's airspace, then then you would like you would call Chandler, let them know what you're doing, and then they would help you and hand you off over to uh, to Mesa. So that's what you wanted to do. So it's you just have to use your common sense. But yeah, it gets busy. Southern California is like this too. So it gets busy, and they're used to it, so they'll know what you're trying to do here. Um, actually, let me let me look at that airspeed thing. When I was reading that, somebody just mentioned they said 250, but uh, in the pattern. In the, in the advisory circle, and I was remiss, I didn't go dig into this, into the regs, but I am very confident. Check out the AC for me, and I'm going to see if I can find it quickly without wasting too much time. Um, but I know, or I'm very confident, 99% sure that it said 200 knots. Where the heck was that? So I will give myself another moment here, and if not, I will look at it later. But check it, here it is, airspeed limitation. So look at the advisory circular 90-66 Bravo, 11.10, 11.10, airspeed limitations. Airplane should not be operated in the traffic pattern at an indicated airspeed of more than 200. I know that 250 comes from the regs, but they're, they're asking us 200 knots. So what the heck are you flying? You're doing more than 200 knots in the pattern. That's crazy. <laughs> so, all right. Okay, that is the official end. Steven, do you want to tell us about the pilot uh, app passport thing? And then we'll give them the, uh, the updates for what's coming next. And then we'll, we'll, we'll officially end after that, but we'll stick around and answer questions. Okay, trying to keep it concise. Uh, within the AOPA app, there is the pilot passport function. It's got some instructions here. Uh, we have an affiliate code. There's a place where you can go into the passport setting, so enter affiliate code to get a special badge and some points for attending this webinar. Uh, the pilot passport, function is a way we've kind of gamified a little bit traveling around and visiting different airfields around the country uh, so you can earn points earn badges and our marketing folks do occasionally do some prize giveaways for things we've got uh, people with different scores in different areas and, and different sections so check it out it's in the aopa app and we have the special code for today's webinar that will get you some uh, some extra points Cool, thanks. And there's the code right there. And again, as Stephen already mentioned, just to reiterate, if you are trying looking for WINGS credit, as long as you put the email in that is for your FAA safety.gov account, you are covered. You don't need to do anything. Um, let's just hit what's coming up next time. Next episode, February 16th, 2023, 12 to 1 Eastern time, or I guess that would be like 10 uh, Mountain Standard time for our friends out there. Um, so I think, I know, yeah, so <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Wax on, wax off techniques for spotless landing so a little we were trying to come up with something without the crane kick but we couldn't quite fit it in here with this title but uh we're going to talk about this is just uh sort of my recommendations um for spotless landings and we'll see if i could research some other stuff too so hopefully we can give you some good tips for making your landings predictable and awesome as much as possible nobody has perfect landings every time either that or they're potentially delusional so okay that said all right dan hit me up what do we got what kind of questions do we have all right well a couple housekeeping hopefully steven you can grab those we had a couple of requests for the code oh you've got it on there great thank you you've already done it um mm -hmm. that's good so um all right so i'm looking back through here through the list there is a lot to get to i feel like we could do this webinar about three hours and then do it again 
um, for another one here, and the questions oh. are still coming in. Oh my goodness! <laughs> All right, Dan, if I can, if I can throw one, and we have a, we had some audience members on AOPA's Facebook page watching as well, okay. and one of the folks on there asked a question about Nordo aircraft. Okay, what's they have a specific question or? It just said Nordo aircraft with a question mark. Okay, so if, I assume we have. I'm not sure if they're trying to get at airplanes that just don't have radios, and then they obviously can operate at a non-towered field. The recommendations, and there is some guidance in uh, AC 90-66 Bravo that just talks about biggest thing is be predictable. Obviously, you're allowed to operate there. It's totally appropriate um, and legal. So the biggest thing they said was for a, a, they really make a super strong recommendation. If you're in a no radio aircraft, make the 45 entry to downwind. Be predictable. You should not be doing straight ins or anything else. Um, make that 45 so people can see you. Um, and then operate as appropriately. Use your good judgment. If it's busy, and you're Nordo, you might not want to be maybe operating at that airport. Maybe you want to come in and land and just call it uh, for the time being until it's not so busy, um, but just be predictable. If for some reason, maybe you lost your radio, obviously you can do the same thing. And unlike a towered air fleet, you're not going to get light gun signals or anything like that, but you would just fly the pattern, use your judgment, try to make yourself as visible as possible. Oh, the one thing I forgot was making yourself visible as possible. I practice I like to use and the FAA even recommended it making your call like I'm turning base turning crosswind turning downwind doing that as you have your wings up makes it easier for other people to see you and having your lights on and everything else helps as well so click the have your lights on while in the pattern turn while like make your calls just before or while you're turning so people can see those wings up it's a lot easier to see you than it is normally when your wings are level with the horizon I hope that answers their question unless there's anything else specific all right, Chris, lots of questions focused on downwind departures. So common practice at my airport um, and then specific instructions on how to do it, things like that. But, you know, if we're hearing correctly, that that is not what you should be doing. No, the, and in fact, that's what I would say is I don't have any guidance for you in that because the guidance that I see from the FAA, and which makes sense to me, is you are not to be doing downwind departures. You are supposed to be doing, you see it right on that diagram. I'll go back to it really quick here. Hopefully everybody's got the code now, that YCF Web 0119. It's the date, January 19th, 23. Um, let me go back real quick though. But look at this graphic right here. It says for, and if you go look and it's all listed out in 90-66 Bravo, it's in the AIM. The departures are to be either straight out on the upwind and climbing or on the 45 to the downwind um, in the direction of the downwind. Get 500 feet above pattern, then turn on course. They are not supposed to be doing downwind departures. Now, at a towered field, that's different. You do what the tower asks you to do, right? You just climb and do whatever. But in a non-towered field, this is the FAA guidance. And look at it. It makes sense, everybody. Get away from the pattern. Get up above and away from the pattern. Get out of the traffic, then turn on course. Um, if you're in the downwind and climbing, it's just, I think it's potential for more uh, traffic, you know, problems. So, so Chris, this this came up when we're talking about airspeed, um, and there's a specific question about legal interpretation of the precedence of AIM guidance versus the advisory circulator. When they're saying different things, what do you do? So, again, that was between the AIM and the advisory circular? Yeah, yeah, 9066B. Yeah, um, I don't necessarily have an answer to that one because I have not seen that come up. Um, they, you know, obviously the AIM has been published a long time. The advisory circular mentions things. My goodness, I, I I don't know how to answer that one. That would have to be an attorney question. I have not seen because it's 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 already like enough where it's like we don't have clear concrete guidance on everything we're supposed to do. So it's just left to our pilot and command judgment. Um, so. Man, I, I guess I would say, what are what are things you could do? You could try calling our pilot information center to see if maybe they know something else. That's a 1-800-USA-AOPA. Uh, the other thing is if you have our legal plan, you could try, you could talk to, I think that'd be a good one to ask one of our panel attorneys to see what they would say about it. Although they tend to be always kind of dodgy about stuff um, uh, on specifics if there's not, because the biggest thing it comes down to is, was there any previous enforcement slash court cases on it that's the where we get precedent that's what we know or a letter of interpretation about it so i don't know what the precedence is there so i, I unfortunately i i can't help you um specifically with that one it's a good it's a good one yeah we did have a few notes about um parachute activity and operations at the airports not specific questions but just like you know what about parachute ops and questions yep. um on that so 
it's in here. It's in the. Yeah. I just did. I just I couldn't do everything right because there's so yeah. much stuff in there. It yeah. has a whole section on that. And the biggest part is it tells you where the. Uh, it gives you some of the ideas like jumpers away. They will be talking to air traffic control um, uh, when they're doing the jump plane. They tell you where they'll be landing and that sort of stuff. So it talks about that in there. So check it out. I think it's towards the end, as I recall. It has jump operations and and what to do. It also talks about rotorcraft gliders, ultralights in there. There's the one on parachute section 12 on parachute ops. It says generally they're going to be deployed between 2,000 and 5,000 feet AGL. Um, it can be expected to be below 3,000 within two miles of the airport. If there's parachute ops going on, obviously maybe avoid the area or coordinate with a jump plane. I've gone and landed at airports in Arizona, on an Eloy is what I remember, um, and they had parachute ops going on. And they you just talk to the jump pilot, they'll help you. And sure. obviously don't fly where there are parachutes. So just be careful. Sure. So you had mentioned that, you know, it's not good practice to, you know, any traffic in the area advise, make that type of radio call there. What about, does that change at all if there's an airport with a lot of glider traffic there? Is it okay to reach out and say, hey, any gliders in the pattern or something like that? Or does that not really change? Again, I would make the call. I've done glider training myself. Now, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to make any kind of claim that I'm a super experienced glider pilot, but I went and I did it and they're really awesome. But uh the big thing there is number one, a lot of gliders don't have radios. So it's like, that's gonna be kind of irrelevant. Some of the gliders will be carrying a handheld radio. They're pilots just like we are. So if you call and say, I'm coming in, I'm gonna be doing a 45 entry to the downwind, et cetera, et cetera. They're gonna queue up and let you know, hey, I'm a glider, I'm out here. Cause trust me, if I'm a glider, if I'm flying in a glider, I wanna let you know, cause I don't have, like, I don't have a lot of options. I can't go around. I can't shot. do a 360. Yeah, I've got one shot yeah. to land. So I'm going to be letting you know and obviously give them right of way because it's like they can't go around. So just try to be aware and yeah. just make that call. Um, I think if you're on that pattern too, it's like where I was, there was a glider school that was operating or even a glider club might be there. The people are going to know where the gliders are as well. So they'll probably let you know. So just make your call, your position call, say your intentions uh, and just be ready, be paying attention and listening and looking more also really importantly. Chris, any recommendations for executing a runway flyover, like looking for FOD or runway obstructions or anything like that? Anything there? Or is that just part of your your normal uh, routine of flying over the airport? Yeah, um, typically, I, I honestly, I can't say that I normally do that at a, a well-used non-towered paved field. If I was concerned, maybe at a grass field or something like that, and I have done that at a grass field or like an, an unpaved field, um, I might, I might do it. And in fact, what I would do is I would do a low approach. I would let everybody know I'm going to execute a low approach. And then I'd be looking and seeing, just checking things out. Um, if you have other aircraft in the pattern, you could just ask them, right? It's like, if you really want to do it, just tell them, I want to make a low approach. If there's nobody there, then make your low approach. That's completely appropriate. It's a, it's a normal thing. So it's nothing out of the ordinary. So you could totally do that. Gotcha. And what about, um, you know, an interesting question about, um, checking the weather and trying to find out what runway is in use looking at the windsock and the segmented circle the question was a thought of if i'm if i'm looking at the segmented circle aren't i too close already and i could be going in the wrong direction by the time you figured out that information good question hopefully like i know i need to wear glasses to see you know that kind of distance when i'm flying so you want to be 500 feet above the highest pattern right typically it's that that's going to typically be 1500 agl I have not had too much trouble overflying the field and looking down and seeing the sock from that altitude. And again, if you need, you know, if, like if you need glasses to fly, which I do, um, I will put my glasses on and I'll make sure that I'm looking as I fly over to see that. Um, so yeah, and the, and the big part there is just paying attention to what are the other aircraft doing. If there's nobody operating at that airport, um, you know, again, I don't know, I don't see, I don't foresee that as an issue. If you stay at 500 feet above pattern, you should be able to see the segmented circle um, and whatever. And there's those socks or tetrahedrons or whatever they might have are typically big enough that you can see that yeah and if okay. there's somebody at the fbo request an airport advisory they might they might tell you there you go question from gillette wyoming uh gillette wyoming regional airport they've got a unicom and a ctaf listed um the airport was once towered but isn't anymore which frequency should you use good question so the if i'm assuming most of the time and i i'm 
I'm not probably going to be able to look up Gillette quickly enough to take it there. But typically, the Unicom and the CTAF are often the same frequency, so you're you're just going to default to CTAF. Um, if the CTAF and the Unicom are different, if you're talking about flying at a non-towered field, use the CTAF. That's what it's for. It's the Common Traffic Advisory Frequency. That's what it stands for. The Unicom, if they are separate, the Unicom then is used by like the FBO for fuel service, that sort of stuff. Um, so things like that. Cool. How about clear of the active at non-towered fields and making that announcement? Would it be better to say, you know, clear of the runway, clear of 1.6? Um, should that be used? Any advice on that one? Okay. So again, I don't know that there's any necessarily specific guidance in the AIM that I can recall. I, I can't say that I reread the entire AIM before this webinar, um, but I know what people are probably arguing because it's like there's not really an active runway at right. a non-towered field because exactly. that's at a towered field. So if you know, if you want to be um, sort of accurate with that, you might say clear of runway blank, whatever. Um, I know it's like it's kind of a uh, slang that we'll often use, um, but you know, you, it's not that much harder to say clear of act, clear of runway two two versus clear right. of the active. So right. if you want to be precise and be um, sort of in the following the aim and that kind of stuff, you should really say the runway and number instead. Chris, interesting um, note, and I think I, I know what they're trying to get at, but it's like the end number is very small and hard to read. So um, is is giving the end number really worthwhile? Well, I, I don't think, and maybe I'll answer this one, correct me if I'm wrong, but it isn't about seeing the end number, but it's about identifying an airplane and making positive identification through using the end number so you know who's where, not that you're actually gonna see the end number on that aircraft, but just you're, you're verbalizing that and then you can make a position connection with a specific airplane and that number so you know who you're talking about. Exactly, it's really about, it's that specific identification so that I'm clear about which Cessna, let's say for instance, was saying that, right? right. So it's Cessna 65659er versus 52407. So right. it's which Cessna is this, It's and it's like, Honestly, even with the end numbers that are big, I'm not looking at those when I'm flying. It's like often those we could just see the airplane. I can't see those end numbers. I mean, maybe you've got amazing vision that um, I certainly don't have that. But it's all about I'm looking for it. They're turning base. I look, I see a Cessna turning base. I'm assuming that's probably them, and I know what they're doing, and I'm looking for right. them to turn final. But if I hear somebody else, another Cessna call on base, now I'm like, okay, well, now we potentially have two aircraft on base right. um, or, or whatever. You know, you can follow. Yeah. So it's not about seeing the actual physical end number. It's about specifically identifying your aircraft. We've had a question on uh, what is the name sandwich? Could you just elaborate on that again and just what that common practice is? Sure. All I meant by that was that when we are at a non-towered field, we're going to say the name of the airport or that what the call sign is for the traffic. So for example, Carroll County traffic. So I say it at the beginning and then I say it at the end, Carroll County. So I say Carroll County traffic, Cessna 65659er, left downwind, runway 16. And I may be wrong about that. I'm just making stuff up. Carroll County. So it's like I say Carroll County traffic at the beginning, I say Carroll County at the end. And again, that idea of that name sandwiches, because those frequencies are often used at multiple airports, it's a way that if I catch, oh my gosh, somebody's on downwind, oh, it's at, I hear that at the end, it's at a different airport. It's not where sure. I am. So that's, we're just trying to make sure we're clear about that. So with that in mind, and this is a tech question, I don't know if you'll know the answer of it, I sure don't. But in my experience and, and a couple others here that have listed it, they can hear the other airports, their traffic announcements, what's happening there. But mm -hmm. when you key your mic and you're speaking at your airport, is that going to step on others at those distances away? Is transmit and receive in the same, have that same effectiveness? That is a good question. Um, and let me think about that. I, I don't know. I don't know the tech one. So this is purely me speculating. Yeah. My thought is, because a lot of times when you hear those, they're really far away. So if they're making calls, do I just transmit over them? I probably don't. If I'm hearing something on the radio, I probably am not transmitting over them. But I'm even trying to think when I've been with other people in the pattern and you hear that, do you hear that like that, you know, like that thing where you can clearly tell somebody's talking and you don't because they're so close that you just hear them. So maybe somebody on the line um, or on the, in the audience might know the answer to that one. but my un un, un um, <laughs> researched answer to that would be I don't think that it would, but if in right. doubt, maybe if as long as it's not busy and you're not dealing with safety in your own pattern, then you could try to not talk over it. But yeah, I, listen I, for some reason I listen bet it's to not talk. Right. Yeah. My guess. What about not. what about taxi announcements at a non-towered field? 
So with taxi announcements, we actually talk about this in our Rusty Pilots course. So generally speaking, you're, it's not really, unless you're crossing over the runway that's in use um, or you're going to taxi onto the runway, if it's busy, you should not be making taxi announcements. So it's like, unless you're calling that um, because, uh, oh, look, actually, it's got Pablo online. He says, I say it does because it's the frequency in use. It could be. Um, as I don't know. It's the question is, it's like, if you hear them, they hear you, you will step on them. That's what Robert's saying as well. So we've got a couple of people saying that. So it's possible. Like I said, I, I don't know. Um, I've just never heard that happen. Anyway, so the taxi. So yeah, generally you shouldn't be making taxiing unless you're going to be, um, you know, I've heard people say the taxiing to runway blank. And mm -hmm. so it's, if it's busy in the pattern, my call would be it's not necessary. If it's not really busy and it's not you're not taking up frequency, then it's not a bad idea to necessarily let somebody know I'm taxiing to that runway. But don't get into all kinds of specifics while you're taxiing. They don't need to know that you're turning left here and turning right there and all this sort of stuff. I think that's unnecessary. Yeah. Here we go. See, now Kurt just said, I always announce that I'm back taxiing. Totally different oh, situation. Yeah. Yeah. Because if you're back taxiing, you're on the you are on the runway. So <laughs> right. anytime you're on that runway, absolutely you should be saying, I am taxiing on the runway. So absolutely, totally agree, Kurt. That is completely appropriate. So Chris, when you're coming into an airport, would you tell your intentions at your first call 10 miles out? Like if you're gonna fly over the field, um, maneuvering for 45, entry to the downwind like would you explain all of that at your 10 mile or would you just say 10 miles west yeah i would say 10 miles west inbound landing yep you know and i might say which runway and then and then as i get closer i will specify maybe at five miles or field right yeah. as i get maybe as i get closer that's what i'm going to start to specify I'm going to be overflying the field from west to east to set up for to set up see i even said four in there yep. so i've got to break that habit of mind to set up um 45 entry to this whatever so i'm letting them know what i'm doing i just try to keep it as short as possible gotcha are there any like recommendations or is it in the regs on when you should be making those announcements is it like 10 miles five three one anything like that the the like you're talking about getting into that kind of breakdown of the criteria yeah. they don't they just say that you should be making your initial call before eight miles so like they say you should be on frequency by 10 and make that call before or by eight is what the the advisory circular says. It's it's all in there. So that's the one thing. And then after that, it doesn't specify. We just want to be communicating. The biggest things we want to communicate and communicate with the other pilots. So don't, you know, make sure that we're concise that we can communicate with each other and we're not dominating the frequency. But at the same time, we're doing whatever is necessary for safety. How about Skyhawk or Skylane instead of Cessna? Is that doing any good? Good question, and here's one I was thinking that myself because sometimes I use Skyhawk when I talk to ATC because that the way if the eight, if air traffic knows their aircraft they'll know it's a 172. Um, the FAA was not in in here in the advisory circular. It was not specific about that. I want to see if I can find that again. Um, self announce. It says uh, call sign and type, and the example that they give it maybe it actually would work because it says Midwest traffic twin commander five one Romeo. So that that seems appropriate. So you could say Skylane or Skyhawk. Um, and that was going to be my next of. question: is what about twin? Because that is a whole different speed. Yep. Um, and different considerations for people on and if they should you know who's got the right of way and who's coming in first. And the other example: this is in ten point three point one in that advisory circle that you get the link to. And the other example they give is an experimental. So it's like if you, if you might want to put in the description. So it says Midwest traffic, experimental Skybolt, November 3 to Delta Sierra, orange and white biplane, 10 miles Northeast. So it's like they, you still have to have your call sign in there. Um, and Skybolt, I assume is the model versus the make on that. Uh, and, and then it even throws in the description though as, as appropriate, but you should not okay. be using that description instead of you know, in place of your type and number, always use the type and number. So yeah, yeah, lots of teardrop mentions and 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 advice and questions going both ways. Should we use it or should we not? Um, on that, because it's becoming common practice apparently as people are coming into non-towered fields uh, if they're flying over the airport. That's a good one. I mean, I think I would understand that. I like, like I said, I prefer to say 45. Um, yeah. A good place to research that, and I just I, I don't have time to do it right now while we're on air. But it would be look in the aim and see if it specifies that. It, it may not. Um, the biggest part is do people understand what we're talking about? So that's yeah. a good one to to look into. We should we should research that and see if there's guidance. Do you ever not if you're overflying an airport, um, just cross country wise, you're not coming into that airport. Is there an, an altitude above that airport where you wouldn't tune into that, or is it just good practice to do that? 
or even on your second radio if you've got it. Hold on. By the way, the only place the AIM has teardrop written in it is under holding and procedure turns. Those are both that IFR procedures. So teardrop entry, and nope. then there's a teardrop procedure turn. So it's not an official term. So it might be better to say the 45. I don't know. Um, all right. So the how high would you be? Um, I, get, I don't have a hard fast rule here. Yeah. If I was, because typically if you're flying cross country, I'm going to typically be at least what at least 2000 if not 3000 agl if i'm on a cross country unless maybe i'm descending into my my um destination so i don't know it's like well, how would i do that if i was going to be overflying a non-towered field probably if i was within 2000 agl and this is just purely me thick off the top of my head i would certainly be talking to them and just monitoring ctaf at a minimum um but it depends if i'm on with flight following then i'm going to be talking to flight following so if in doubt my recommendation is stay higher stay stay away and if you think that you've got potential traffic conflicts then get on and talk to them yeah uh here's a note on position reporting locals will more intuitively place you in their mental map if you report your position relative to relative to a local landmark which makes perfect sense except if you're not from that airport and not familiar with the area then you don't know right my gosh, you guys are hitting on all this stuff. It's in the advisory circular, and they mentioned again. I just couldn't, I couldn't hit everything, but they clearly say do not use local landmarks, even though locals know what they are. Or if you do, add it on, and it's the same for our instrument pilots. So if you're doing instrument practice, instrument approach, or even on an actual approach, if you're using local landmarks, you, it's like you might do that, but you need to be adding in five miles south of the airport or whatever. Give a position that people that are not from that area or in the case of instruments, for a VFR only pilot that doesn't know instruments, they'll have no idea where the heck these intersections, even instrument pilots, if they're not familiar with the approaches in that area, aren't gonna know where those intersections right. are. So um, it's much better to always add in five miles south of the airport and how I'm straight in or whatever I'm doing for this approach and or uh, for those landmarks. You know, three miles southwest of the field over whatever it might be like the uh, the, the water tower or whatever you guys might be using. All right, so we're caught up for the first part of this and I'm looking through some specifics as well that were, um, I thought were good. Um, AIM 5-4-27 is no reference to altitude. You mentioned starting overhead approach, find read above traffic pattern altitude. Yeah, check out the article as well. I know that the AIM is very, like limited about what they say. So I was getting this information from a couple different places. I mentioned that article. There's a video that uh, Dave Hirschman did from AOPA. Um, it's mentioned in the, and it's again, not a lot of details mentioned in the advisory circuit, but it just mentioned that it is an option. Um, the 500 feet I got from someone, it was the person who wrote in that's an experienced warbird pilot and they were the ones saying that. And I know from doing it, because I've actually done a little bit of formation training and it was the same thing, you, you're above the pattern. And I was trying to remember, that's why I couldn't remember myself. And that's why when he said that, I'm like, that's what I recall too. So mm -hmm. um, there's going to be a, there's going to be more online about that, especially with the warbird formation training. And there's a lot of that that goes on, which the one person mentioned that it happens all the time. So just keep that in mind. Instrument approach question. If I'm on a 10 mile instrument final and someone in the pattern jumps in front of me on final, would I stop my descent at pattern altitude and maintain runway heading um, and just proceed to the crosswind or downwind or what? Okay, so read it to me again. So somebody is practicing on a, a 10 mile approach. instrument final and someone in the mm -hmm. pattern jumps in front of them. So basically, I think the question is, should I stop the descent or should I yeah. continue on there? What what should I do? What's the best practice there? Great question. So. This is because I, I, I'm, uh, I, I've, I've taught, I've done this kind of stuff with teaching instrument students. So the big thing, let's say you're 10 miles out, you got ways out. This is where that communication part comes in. Now, number one, 10 miles out, you're probably not that low because on an instrument approach, you're typically not getting that low till you're within maybe three to five miles from the airport. Um, and then it might be below pattern. So number one, communicate. So talk to the person that's in the pattern. If it's not terribly busy and it's just one person, let them know I'm 10 miles out. We're on a straight end doing this instrument approach. and Talk, they, they want to do their pattern great talk to them about it you're not cutting they're not cutting you off necessarily if they're you know seven miles ahead of you or whatever or eight miles ahead of you so talk to them when it comes to the altitude yes if there's traffic in that pattern i will limit like i will tell my student you are limited to this altitude we're not going to go all the way down because we don't want to be causing a traffic conflict in that case so you definitely want to be maybe just going down the pattern altitude and that's where you're going to call it for that day 
Um, and that's just part of the challenge of training on instruments, especially in VFR or VMC um, uh, conditions. So that's where you can use the SIM to get down lower, or whatever. So yes, use good judgment. If you're that far out and you want to do that, talk to the people there. Say, we'd like to come in at this altitude. Are you okay with that? Can you see us? You know, and just communicate with them. Um, but it, I would say that generally, if you're in VFR conditions and there's other traffic, try to stick to what would normally be more of a VFR pattern so they, they can see you unless you're like, again, maybe there's one other person and you're communicating with them and letting them know what you're doing. Um, so got to use judgment, got to be courteous. Chris, I think this one would be related to um, a circling approach to circle landing, a specific airport, K-A-U-N, people fly the RNAV to seven and then break off directly to downwind for two five. So is that a circling to land? That's approach? a circle to land approach. Yes. Yeah. And so and it just it just mentioned that they thought that this was dangerous. Um, I okay. guess it's hard to know not not knowing exactly the layout of how that is, but I guess numbers wise they're coming in on the back course, right? Um, yeah, on the back course, but I mean they're coming in the other other direction. Another the runway. runway. Yeah. Right. So again, this is where it's. What does it come back to? What are our rules of thumb here? courteous use good judgment right and any other part of the faa says multiple times do not disrupt the pattern so if the pattern's busy should you be doing that probably not that's probably a bad idea maybe you should be limiting your altitude to 500 feet above pattern so you can do that and fly out of the area right just like if you're overflying the field um you've got to figure out you've got to use your own judgment i don't have definite answers here you just got to be smart about it don't don't cause a hazard if the pattern's not busy and you want to do that, then communicate with the other traffic in the pattern. Let them know. Like, you know, there's one other person just doing touch and goes, say, hey, this is what we'd like to do. Just let, you know, giving you a heads up. Is that okay with you? You know, will you work with us? So, and I will talk that way on the radio. If I'm, like, if it's not busy and I'm working with, I would literally just say, 65659er, we'd like to request to do this, you know, and then just try to work it out with them. So you just, you just got to use good judgment. And it's, like I said, if people are doing that in a busy pattern, that, that does sound dangerous to me. So you know, that should be addressed to try to work that out. Okay. How about a straight in and sidestepping to the left? Oh my gosh, maybe I shouldn't have started this one. Sorry, I'm struggling <laughs> to make sense of it. I'll just read it. Maybe you can make sense of it. But how about a straight in and sidestepping to left upwind to a left crosswind and then joining the left downwind? So straight in, sidestep yep. to the left, left upwind. To then a left turn crosswind. crosswind. So it looks right. like they're going left of the runway center line. So flying yeah. in probably higher altitude. And instead of coming across the field, they're coming in above the runway and then sidestepping the runway to the left and then making a left right. okay. crosswind to downwind to left base. Sometimes there are there's situations where that may be appropriate. Parallel runways. And in fact, I saw uh, Robert Deer Valley. I used to fly at Deer Valley, so I'm going to give you a shout out for Arizona right there, and I'll I'll try to hit your question really quick in a minute. But um, so like at Deer Valley at night, there are parallel runways. So in that situation, we would sidestep into the pattern a little bit because otherwise we're jumping into the other pattern for the other runway. So that depends. Um, there may be geographical reasons or noise abatement reasons where that may be specifically that's what they do at that airport. But as a general rule, I will step away from the pattern. I don't want to be going, getting closer to oncoming traffic. Um, you got to figure that typically our down ones are like a half mile out. So it's like, it's usually not that, but usually I try to step away. So as a general practice, I would say no, step away, make your crosswind potentially. And if it's busy, again, let me please reiterate, go do the 45 entry. So like, don't be making these straight in things unless you know that you're not disrupting traffic, it's not busy. Even though the FAA allows for it, I always recommend, and I agree with them, do the 45 entry instead. But if it's not busy, let's say you're doing this straight in, maybe you're doing a practice instrument approach, et cetera, et cetera, then usually my default would be step away from the pattern, barring parallel runway, some geographical features, barring noise abatement that I know about at that local airport, and that's what other pilots expect. The biggest thing is be predictable, be expected. And I know we're getting close to our time. Hey, let me hit up Robert's question here really quick. He was asking about local landmarks at Deer Valley. The big thing at Deer Valley is it's a towered field. So generally we were hitting, we would, I'm trying to remember, we would say like Squaw Peak, which I know they changed the name, I think it's Picacho Peak now. Um, uh, we would use these other landmarks because air traffic control knew what we were talking about, and that's different, right? At night, we would do that too, but really that was not the best practice. The best practice would be instead to say, 
that might maybe I make that landmark call, but I also give the distance and time. And I know we're we're coming to we're actually over time here, so maybe we do one more and we'll call it a day because I there's so many questions, but I know we can't do all of these. Um, not that we don't want to. In fact, who knows? Maybe at the end of the year we do another one where we hit the best questions that we weren't able to get to. Yeah, it feels like there's some, some great ones here. How about uh, an IFR question for non-towered ops? Every time I've been IFR into an untowered airport, the traffic pattern hasn't been busy. So my IFR straight in approaches have been non-events. But in the but if the pattern was busy, what's good procedure other than canceling IFR once ATC hands you off to the local CTAF? Yeah, and in fact, it says, look at the advisory circular. It has specific mentions on multiple places of IFR uh, coming in on an approach, even on an IFR clearance. It specifically says, even on an IFR clearance, you do not have uh, right of way or, or precedence over VFR traffic. So the smart thing would be is, let's say you're doing a straight in. Um, in that case, then maybe that's that sidestep. You're going to do that. Let everybody know. I'm on an instrument clearance. I'm gonna, maybe I stay at altitude, right? I'm going to sidestep, make that sort of upwind entry to the crosswind, communicate. If it's really busy and you're in VMC, like it's clear you're, you're doing IFR just because you like the, the protection, you like the guidance, but it's really a VFR day, then maybe instead break off, cancel the IFR, come in and do the 45 entry. Um, so just use good judgment. If it's busy, be predictable, be courteous. If it's not busy, then potentially maybe you're able to work with the traffic that is there and just do sort of the upwind thing. We just sort of that fly over the runway, do the upwind sort of thing, the straight in approach. But again, in all cases, they are very clear, which makes total sense to me. Do not disrupt the traffic flow that's there. So even if you're on a straight in, you are not to disrupt the traffic flow. Awesome. Well, I think that'll do it. I think for the most part, we've got these at least categorically answered, but I do <laughs> like the idea. Uh, we'll look back through these questions and see if we can have a best of, but um, you know, there's a lot of common questions for sure and certainly appreciate the participation. Uh, this has been really fun. Mm -hmm. Oh, by the way, one last one really quick. I see that I've heard a couple of the fly-in ones. When it comes to the fly-ins, follow the procedures that are published for the fly-in. They will typically address all this stuff. I know when we did them, um, we had all kinds of a notum and everything else. Check the notum, find that stuff out. That's where you'll generally see what these practices are. Um, they'll publish that stuff. So, all right, awesome. Phew, <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> all right. All right, we're wrapping it up. This reminder, next episode is February 16th. Uh, same time, 12 to 1 Eastern. There it is. Wax on, wax off. Techniques for spotless landings. I can't wait for that one. That'll be fun. All right. I love it. Awesome. Chris, Stephen, thank you so much. It was great to be here with you guys today. Thanks for the opportunity. Appreciate it. And um, we appreciate everyone getting out here and joining us today on Don't Get Rusty. That's right. Thanks, right. everybody. And yes, Michael, flight following was in there. We just we will talk about that one later. <laughs> All right, folks. See you all next time. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.